Hi, good morning, church. Hey, let me ask you an odd question as we start off this morning. I might be a, a weird person, but let me tell you one thing that I love in the world is oxymorons. Uh, not paradoxes. I don't like confusing things, but I like oxymorons. I would imagine there's other people like me. You kind of hear them. They're all over the place. But let me ask you this. Anybody got a favorite oxymoron that you can think of? A phrase that you just like, that's ironic. What is it? Somebody got something? Alone together. Alone together. Uh, people say that kind of thing. You're like, what does that even mean? Man, what does that mean? Now, we're in the same place, I guess, lonely. What else? What are some favorite oxymorons out there you can remember? Anybody think of any? I'll put you on the spot. You're like, I don't normally think of oxymorons. Same difference, same difference jumbo shrimp. Organizational government. Ah, that's an oxymoron. What in the world are we talking about? I made a list. I could go all day. I was thinking of some of my favorite. I, I used a couple, uh, an oxymoron uh, a couple weeks ago. Good grief. You know, Charlie Brown, soft rock music. I always thought, I don't think that's compatible. Soft rock. A sanitary landfill. When people say that thing was pretty ugly, I'm thinking, pretty ugly. I, that's an oxymoron. Almost, you, you almost perfect. I'm like, that's an oxymoron. It's not perfect. It's almost perfect. And then, you know what? Last year, I did a sermon. I was talking about oxymorons. And I said, you know, in a spiritual sense, in a Christian sense, there are several things that I think about that are oxymorons. Back then, the example I gave when I talked about oxymorons is there's no such thing as a non-Christian disciple. I think sometimes we get confused with that. Somehow you can be a Christian and not a disciple. You can be a disciple and not a Christian. I think we really get confused. I've heard pastors say that kind of a thing. And I'm like, nope. Nope, can't be. Well, I've got another one for you this morning. Started thinking about oxymorons. Here's, a, here's an oxymoron in the life of a Christian. There is supposed to be no such thing as a thankless Christian. An ungrateful Christian. Started to think about this idea at Thanksgiving and started to think about Christians, looking at God's word when it comes to Thanksgiving and and I started looking around at the world, and, and certainly we live in a world that is thankless, in my opinion, in my observation. But, but even more sad and more serious to me is that in 30 years of serving the church, in church leadership, is that a lot of times I look at the church. I look at my own life as a Christian sometimes, and I think it could be characterized as borderline moving into an era where we'd be called thankless. I started to think about why that is. Why would someone be, whether they're a Christian or not, be thankless? And the truth is, the reason why they're thankless is because of a greater problem. You're, you, if you ever find yourself in a position where you can't say thank you and you, you're thankless, it's, especially for a Christian, it is because you have a deeper problem that you are ungrateful. The underlying motivation behind being unthankful is that you're ungrateful in that as a Christian, maybe for the world they would say, well, I don't have anything to be thankful for, but as a Christian, it's, it's an oxymoron for you to be thankless because in order for you to be thankless would mean you're ungrateful and you're ungrateful for the innumerable gifts that God has showered down on your life. I mean, we live in a culture that spawns this kind of an attitude. We live in a culture of materialism it is a culture that says we should want more things and, and I want to clarify this I started to just stop there when I was preparing this sermon and it's not wrong to want things there are times where you want things we need things let me tell you what the culture of materialism tells you is that you always have to have more and more and more things. The culture of materialism that we live in would tell us that whatever we have at any given time is not enough Whatever we're doing at any given time is not enough. We always, we live in a culture that says you need more. And, and that doesn't even have to apply to things. Of course it is that whatever I have, I, I need to have more than. If, if whatever clothes I got last Christmas, they're already old and they're not good. And therefore I need newer clothes. That the iPhone I got last year is not good anymore. I need another one. Friends, I can't even tell the difference in these phones. I'm still on number 12, and I, it, it works. It does everything the other ones do, but I think we live in a culture that says, I got to get it. Why? Because it's new. I think whatever mother you are and every father you are, we live in a culture that says you ought to be better than whatever it is that you are. And whatever job you have, we live in a culture that says, I, I have to have and I need a, a better one. You live in a world that tells us, just like the, 
the wealthy ty- tycoon Paul Getty who, who coined the phrase, the best things in life are things, is what he would say. He's wrong. We live in a culture of materialism. We live in a culture of covetedness. Covetedness meaning, it's a word that just says we, I think, desire stuff too much and we desire too much stuff. We live in a world that says we don't have enough, we need more. I want what others have because it's better. We live in a world that is because of that. Let me tell you what it causes and spawns. Lots of things, but it it surrounds us with complainers. But to be that as a Christian, when I look at Scripture, is a contradiction in terms. If we're not careful, I think it's one of those things that's worth taking a whole sermon and talking about because we're, we're not immune to this kind of a disease. The, you, know, you look around and I think it's a disease that infects so many people and, and I don't think we're immune to catching that, that disease. And so we ought, to, we ought to talk about it. And here's why we ought to talk about it. Because I, I think the world is, is infesting the church. I, I look at this and think the church is becoming more like the world when it comes to the idea of gratitude. And I read studies all the time. There was a book that came out years back called Unchristian. It was an interesting book by Kinnaman and, and a couple other researchers who got together and basically just wanted to go to people who were not Christians and ask them, what do you think of Christians? It's fascinating to hear their opinion. There's tons of information in there and they give you all kind of stats, but, but one of the studies that that was done, they, they would survey people, and these people would say 84% of everybody that they surveyed would say that they knew at least one committed Christian in the United States of America. The interesting part was, yet 15% thought that the lifestyles of those Christian followers were not significantly different from their own lives. Meaning that I know a Christian, almost everybody knew a Christian, it's just when they looked at their lives, they're like, I can't really feel the difference in their life and mine. The way they talk, the way they act... What seems important to them doesn't seem a lot of difference from our lives. And, and friends, it ought not be that way. I mean, I think we intrinsically know that, but Scripture says that. I look at Scriptures, and I'm just going to give you two here, that the whole point of these Scriptures is to show you the difference between a worldly heart and a, and a Christ-following heart from the things that matter to the world and the things that ought to matter to Christians. I think of Romans 1.21 that says, For although they knew God, talking about people of the world, although they knew God, they did not honor God Um, him as God, or, listen to this, they did not give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. What's the difference between a Christ follower who's filled with the Spirit and those who are futile in their thinking? They didn't honor God as God, and it was important enough for Paul to write this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, they were people who wouldn't give thanks. When we are people who don't live with thankful hearts and we don't give praise and honor and thankfulness to God for the things that we have, one, it, it looks like the world. I think of 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 5. Paul is instructing his young ministry student, Timothy, and he says, here's what the world will become around you, Timothy. He says, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Listen to this one. Ungrateful. Unholy, heartless, unpeaceable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. I mean, Paul doesn't just say there's a difference. He even gives them a last instruction. Timothy, here's what I would tell you about these people. Avoid such people. He's given Timothy this this advice. He's saying, because why? That kind of thing will infest you. If you surround yourself with that, you'll catch it. You'll catch the disease. I want to show you an interesting story, an encounter from Jesus' life. I want you to grab your Bibles and open up to Luke chapter 17, if you haven't already done that. I want you to look at verse 11. I want to show you just from an interesting encounter in Jesus' life why this is important. Important to Jesus, important to God. Why it ought to be important to us. Jesus is ministering in, in the area of Jerusalem, the area between Samaria and Galilee. Did a lot of ministry in Capernaum and Galilee area. And, it, and I just want to show you a couple things. I want to just kind of unpack this in little sections so that I can paint for you the picture. When we're studying a story and an account from Jesus' life, I think it's helpful to kind of make sure we put our feet in the pages of the Bible 
and understand what actually happened here instead of just looking at the words. Look at verse 11. Let's read these first four verses. On the way to Jerusalem, he, Jesus, was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And these ten lepers, verse 13, lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. I'm sure they were yelling this to the top of their lungs because they're far away. And when Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. Hmm. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell at the feet of Jesus, giving him thanks. Let me, let me tell you the first section, first little thing as we kind of paint the scene and put our feet in the text that we see here. We see an incredible miracle happen, but it's a unique miracle from some other miracles. I mean, there's lots of miracles that Jesus did, and they're, they're usually generally all the the kind of saying, a couple things that are interesting here. Jesus performs a miracle, but it doesn't happen immediately. That's interesting to me. And two, it's a group healing. You know, usually it's one person. A lady slips through the crowd and touches Jesus' robe. She's healed, or he heals this leper by touching the leper, which was a fascinating thing in and of itself. Jesus didn't have to touch a leper, but he did. He made it a point to touch him. I mean, there's all these kind of things, but a mass healing occurs here. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem, and before he gets there, he's kind of on the outskirts, it says here, of Samaria and Galilee. Ten lepers stood there in, I'm sure, various stages of decay, because that's what leprosy does. Leprosy, essentially is decaying your body. I mean, appendages are rotting off, noses, eyelids, hair, a lot of, depending on your stages, you might have just had a nub for an arm, your toes were missing, and, and they're standing there, I'm sure they're closed. They are, they are the pariah. They are, in this culture, would have, people would have assumed they are unclean. They would have kept their distance from them. You don't want to be unclean. They weren't allowed to have jobs, married, interact with their family. They were in complete outskirts of society, and they would have been standing there. And I'm sure they would have been doing what Leviticus and Numbers told us, is that they would have been warning other people, even with their own unveiled lips and skulls that looked all mealy and scaly and, and dry. They would have been warning people, stay away. Unclean, unclean. What a horrible life. I mean, not just the leprosy, but you are completely ostracized from life. Any hopes you have that we all have as human beings, I want to be married, not for these. I want jobs, I want advancement, I want fellowship, I want community, I want provision. No, they have nothing. People wouldn't even pay them attention. They don't exist. These are invisible people. They looked like dead people, although they were alive. These were human beings. They were sensitive human beings that were living on society's fringe. And, and they, from a safe distance away, shouted out what would have been the traditional saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Master, I'm sure they said it over and over again. Master, please, please have mercy on us. And here's one of the things I love about Jesus most. Jesus saw the invisible people. I mean, there's so many things I can be thankful for Jesus about. I mean, John chapter 5, go read it on your own. It's my favorite account of Jesus' life. But Jesus had a knack for looking and finding people that nobody else wanted to see. Thank God. Thank God for all of us. In 1991, before I knew Jesus, I was an invisible person, and yet he saw me. And not only did he see me, he came to rescue me. He talked to me. Jesus saw, and he responded immediately. This time he responds differently, like I said before, than he has with the other lepers. I mean, I think it was fascinating that Jesus would go out of his way to touch a leper. That was an interesting thing to me. He didn't have to. I mean, Jesus can raise somebody from the dead from another town. We know that already from Scripture. But he made it a point for these ceremonially unclean people that were saying, stay away. He made it a point to show everybody, look, I want to purposely go up and touch a leper so you'll know who I am and know that I, I love everybody. But he didn't do that. He just says to these lepers who are begging him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and show yourself to the priest. And for us, maybe if we're not familiar with first century, we're not familiar with, with Jewish custom, we're not familiar with this passage of scripture, we'd be like, what an odd thing to say. 
I mean, he, shouldn't he have looked at him and said, be clean? But he did. Go and show yourself to the priest. And here's why you would go and show yourself to the priest, is that this was a stipulation in Leviticus 14 that when you had been healed from leprosy or another disease, that you would then, after you've been healed, go to the priest, and that priest would then examine you. And if you're cured, then you would, I guess, get off of the list of unclean. And you would have your life back. It would now be okay for you to be married and to reunite with your family and to have hope again and to have a future and people would recognize you again. Jesus has not healed them but tells them in their leprosy like they've been healed to go to the priest so they can be examined. Jesus gave them a command that absolutely required faith. I mean, just, it did. And like any group of people, you get ten people together, they're not going to agree. Just, they're not on anything. I would imagine these ten lepers probably had a discussion about this. That's just what I presume. Probably shouldn't do that with the word, but it's fun to read between the, the white spaces and between these sentences. And I know at one point they, they parted ways. I'm, I'm sure... Some were convicted to go to the priest immediately, and probably others talked. There's probably some argument about whether they should do this. I can think of all kind of analogies why they shouldn't. I mean, there's probably one in the group that said, man, that's a long way. We've got to walk all the way. Like they had taxis or Uber back then. They're like, man, we've got to go all the way to the priest, man. Probably somebody looking around and be like, man, why wouldn't he heal us? If Jesus can heal us, why wouldn't he just do it right now? I don't understand why we're going to see the priest. I would have said there and been like, this is, we're going to look like fools. We're going to look like morons, man. We're going to go to the priest. Clearly, we're not healed. People are going to think we have mind problems if we do this. And then there probably was at least one. We know there was at least one in the crowd, probably two, that would have said, hey, well, what do we have to lose, man? What do we, we got something on our appointment books today? <laughs> Let's go. I don't know. Why? I don't know. What else are we going to do today? Sit around and, and beg people. And so I'm sure the consensus was, however they got there, to be like, let's give it a, a try. And so they set off. And man, this is one of those times where you wish we had more details of what they said and how it happened. You wish that this was recorded or there was some street cam or something we could have seen. There was a progressive miracle. I would imagine there was progressive. It didn't happen immediately. They weren't healed. Somewhere along the way, they got healed. They didn't have mirrors. They didn't have phones. And so it would have had to been the other ten that were watching each other get healed from leprosy, matter of fact. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know if they were walking along. All of a sudden it was like, oh, Bill, your eyebrows have come back. Look at your skin, man. It looks supple, man. It looks great. It's, it just don't look like a reptile anymore. This is amazing. Hey, there would have been a moment where they would have felt their toes fill up their shrunken sandals again. Their nubs would have started growing back. I don't know. Their eyelids would have come back. Their nose that would have been sheared off because of leprosy. All this started growing back. They would have noticed it. I can only imagine the scene that day would have been pure. Probably confusion slash excitement, joy. Look at what's happening to us. And that's not the most fascinating part to me. The most fascinating part to me is that out of those ten, only one, only one had this reaction. One. One of them was a Samaritan, which is odd because we read Scripture and usually the Samaritans had nothing to do with the Jews and vice versa, the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans. But I would imagine when you're a leper, the field has been leveled. (laughs) It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, leper, Samaritan, leper, you are now united by your suffering and not by your nationality. There's one, he's a Samaritan, he's a foreigner. He's the only one and his response is this, his is unstoppable gratitude why would it not be 10 of them like after you got past the excitement of like the miracle that just happened before our eyes not to be like let me remember the giver he did this we had doubts but he did it 
unstoppable gratitude. Unstoppable thankfulness. So much so that this one felt it much more important to go back and tell Jesus thank you than it was for him to go back to to the temple and get his life back together physically. I heard one pastor say his spiritual obligation overrode his ceremonial need. And so they parted companies. He had unstoppable thankfulness. In his mind, he wanted to go thank two people we see from the scripture, not knowing, ironically, that they're the same being. <laughs> I mean, in verse 15, he first he wanted to thank God, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turning back, praising God with a loud voice. I love it. He wasn't even shy about it. That word in the, uh, the Greek is so great. The word loud is megas, and the word voice is phone. Megas phone. Does that sound like any English word we got? A megaphone, man, as loud as he could say it, he wanted to praise God. I, the whole trip back to find Jesus, he was like, first thing I want to do is just praise God for this. And two, he wanted to find Jesus. I don't know what he knew of Jesus. Clearly, he believed that he was master, that he was Lord. He had enough faith to realize this person is working for God. Only God can do this. Whoever this is, he's close. You see that in verse 15 and, and 16. It's, it's incredible. I mean, just one lone thank you. That's, that's what we have. It's fascinating to me. I feel like there'd be more than one. Look at verse 17 and 19. What did Jesus, what was his response bunch of rhetorical questions is what Jesus responds with. Verse 17, then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? I mean, Jesus doesn't have a bad memory. He, he knows how many were cleansed. Where are the nine? I think the most profound question is, was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner, the Samaritan? And he said to the Samaritan, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well, Jesus asked some questions that he already knows the answer to. I thought it, there, was, there was ten of y'all. Where, where are these other nine people? I can't believe it. Only one came back here and it's Samaritan. Were they not thankful is what Jesus was saying? The other nine, were they not, were they not thankful? Look, and friends, I would say this. I, I, I'm trying not to be a historical, scriptural snob. I think we do that a lot. We look back and we think, I can't believe. I can't believe it. It's easy to do that. I tell that to my class in 1 Samuel. You just want to look at the Israelite people in the Old Testament and be like, what was wrong with these people, man? How thick was their skull? And then I look in the mirror and be like, oh, Brad. How routinely, I'm like, how thick is your skull, man? Try not to be a snob here. And, and I, I, here's what I would say. I, I, I'm not, I want to cut some slack to these nine. I think there's some things that are understandable. I, I can think of answers to that. It, if they had a chance to respond, was it that they're not thankful? No, I think they probably were thankful. Maybe they were just in a hurry to see the priest. Isn't that a good answer? Maybe, why go back? They could have been like, Jesus is gone by now. We're not going to find this guy. It's not like he has a cell phone. Odds are he's left. He travels from city to city. He was just going through town. He's not still going to be there. Maybe Jesus will know He'll assume we're grateful. Man, we've been healed. He's going to know we're grateful. I don't need to go tell him this. I mean, I'm doing what he told us to do, right? I don't want to be disobedient. Jesus gave me the instructions to do what I'm doing right now. Of course they were thankful. Of course they were not just happy. I'm sure they were deeply happy. And let me tell you what the motivation of their heart, though, was. They were grateful to a degree. It was vague. Assumed. They were happy, I'm sure, but they were eager. What did it show? They were eager, more eager, more thankful to get back to their lives, what they had lost in this world. And I think we can have sympathy for them 
for not returning to Jesus. But here's what we learn from this passage of Scripture is that there's a problem here. And the truth is, what do we learn from the story? It seems understandable, but there's a deadly problem here. Maybe they had gratitude and they had thankfulness, but God wasn't at the center of their gratitude. And I, I think the, I note Jesus' final question, was no one found to return? And he didn't say give thanks. They didn't want to come and give praise to God. Even my people, the other nine were my people, and this foreigner comes and says, I want to give praise to God. The other nine, I think, were world-focused, like the shrewd manager, like the rich young ruler we see in the preceding parables right before this. They missed the spiritual aspect to this completely. What do we learn from this? I, I, friends, I'm say with absolute confidence, vague and assumed gratitude on Jesus' part was not the appropriate response for Jesus. And let me tell you why. Because Jesus wanted to give them more. Jesus wanted to give them more than things. He wanted to give them more than their life back. He wanted to give them more than healing of their flesh and jobs and marriage and those kind of things. He wanted more than their bodies. He wanted their hearts. He wanted to heal their flesh, but more so he wanted to heal their souls. And what they didn't realize, painfully thinking about it today, is that by failing to return and acknowledge Jesus... And just trying to get on with their worldly lives. They missed out on the greatest possible moment of their existence. Jesus wanted to give them so much more than what the world can give them. And we see that in the pronouncement that he gave to this one that returned and acknowledged him. Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And let me just say, this is one of the times where the English translation does not do that justice. One of my favorite words in all of the Greek is the word sozo. We would see it as S-O-Z-O. That's the word used here at the end of this verse where it says that go and, and you'll be made well. But that word is quite literally in the Greek saved. It's the word for saved. We were to read this as literally as we can in verse 19. Your faith has saved you. Wanted to give them so much more. I mean, here this ama- imagine how amazing this scene is. Walking on that dirt road and your physical leprosy fell off of your body. How much more amazing would it have been to see your spiritual leprosy fall away? And we're all going to die from something physically. Leprosy, cancer, old age, heart attacks, whatever. But we don't all have to die spiritually. What good is it, Jesus might say, to have your body healed of leprosy and forfeit your soul? What good is it to gain the whole world and forfeit your soul? He received forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life and, and not only removed him from being an alien to the rest of society, but more importantly, he was no longer an alien distant from God because of his moral sickness. And I want to just be clear here. Look, Jesus is not teaching that in order to obtain salvation, we need to be thankful But he is telling us that those who have a true faith, if we sit in this room and we're filled with the Spirit of God and He has redeemed our life from the pit, those who have a true faith should have profoundly thankful hearts. We should be the most thankful people in existence. There's a problem. If we're not, something has gone wrong. And he repeats it over and over and over in Scripture because it's a problem. I mean, if I go through Scripture, I'm just going to take you on a little Bible survey here. I could take you to the book of Psalms alone, and we were reminded no less than 50 times that our job is to be people who are giving thanks. I think of 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that says, Here's the will of God's life for, for, will of, of God for your life. Give thanks when? In all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Corinthians. 
Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think of Hebrews 13, 15. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of knowledge of Him everywhere. Hebrews 12.28 Therefore let us be grateful. Why? For receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship and reverence and awe or as simple as you can remember Colossians 3.17 And whatever you do in word and deed do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I mean, the New Testament is clear. Believing hearts are hearts that praise and glorify God. And God reminds us frequently. Why? Because we need reminding. We are good at tuning out reminders. That's why our moms looked at us as kids and would start off, let me give you a reminder. I can tear my mom. I've already told you, don't be eating that cookie before we have dinner. And she would walk over. Now, let me remind you, oh, there's going to be some consequences. You reach in there. And you know what Brad would do? I forget the reminder. Let me remind you what happens in this house when we lie to people. I can hear my dad. And what would Brad do? Forget those reminders. So what would they do? They would offer more reminders. Physical ones even sometimes. Painful ones. Because the verbal ones didn't stick. And we can do that with God. We do it from God because we've already learned it early on what to do. And everyone else that will remind you parents, why do we do this? Because, you know, it's teaching a bigger lesson. If we let our kids blow off our reminders, we're teaching them they can blow off their Heavenly Father's reminders too. And you know what it teaches them? Sometimes when it also teaches us, not only do we blow it off, but I think if we're not careful, we can become what John Bloom, an author, would say is, is a fake thinker. I mean, we are all sinners, and, and sinners, I think we could aptly say, are self-absorbed. And, and we usually, if we're not careful, we'll get infested by this world that we live in, and we model our lives after other self-absorbed sinners and if we're not careful, even when we offer gratitude, if we're not careful, we can use it as a tool instead of just an expression of our hearts. I mean, I heard somebody, even in the last couple of weeks, utter this thing. If you want more people to give you stuff, make sure you tell them thank you. Make sure you, you write people and tell them thank you for stuff, otherwise they'll keep, quit sending you cards and, and things. And I'm thinking, while that may be true in a pragmatic sense, I'm not sure that's the motivation for why we should be telling them thank you. Maybe that's what the other nine were assuming. Maybe they were using their gratitude as more of a gear-greasing courtesy or a reputation enhancer. What do we learn from this? Very quickly, we, we learn that to say thank you is important, but to say thank you without feeling thankful, is, it's not okay. John Bloom, he would say it like this, thankless gratitude is like affectionless love. It's like joyless happiness. It's like the form of godliness without its power. It's not okay. It's not the real thing. And as, as long as we practice it, we're missing out on the joy God intends to give us through thanksgiving. And so maybe we ask ourselves today at the end of this challenge, before we become historical, biblical snobs against these people. Maybe we ask ourselves, how often do you take God's blessings for granted? It's a question only you can answer. How often do you take God's blessings for granted, and because of that, taking it for granted, fail to thank God for the things that he has showered gifts upon us for? Do you, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, do you thank God in all circumstances? Have you? Have you enjoyed the gift from the giver and forgotten the giver? Are we quick to pray and ask, but slow then to follow up and give praise for the answers? The end of this account ends oddly with this unusual man, this Samaritan who shouted glory to God, fell at Jesus' feet and praised him. 
Here's what I know. It, it pleased the Lord, though. Jesus was happy about this. I mean, the other ones, it's so interesting and unusual because the other guys were obeying the law. Isn't that interesting? I mean, this is a little side sermon as we end here and kind of debated whether to even bring this up because we want to go and eat or something like that. But this is an odd response. It didn't seem like the right response. Jesus told him to do something, and what he told him to do was obeying the Levitical law, and yet he was more happy with this one who came back. I mean, I'm just asking the question. I read this kind of thing. When you read Scripture and you put yourself in the pages, I'm like, there's got to be a point. Everything is in here because it's useful. This act by this man pleased the Lord more than the others, even though they were obeying the law. And, and here's the verse that came to my mind, Psalm 51, 15 through 17. David says, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are what? What are the sacrifices of God? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Instead of going to the priest, the Samaritan became a priest and he built his altar at the feet of Jesus. Think of Psalm 116, 12 through 19 very quickly. What shall I render to the Lord for all of its benefits to me? Here's what the psalmist is saying. What shall I give to God for all that he's benefited in my life? Here's what I'll give to him. I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the son of your maidservant. You have loosened my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people and in the courts of his house in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. In coming to Jesus, this man received something greater than physical healing. He also was saved from his sins. And so what do I offer you very quickly? A couple simple truths that we learn from this. One, one of the greatest things that we can do as a believer in Jesus Christ is to just say uh, thank you to God. Why? Because it's our calling. It's what we were created to do. Number two, what do we learn from this? Ingratitude is the leprosy of the soul. It eats away on the inside. It destroys our joy, cripples our happiness, withers our compassion, paralyzes our praise, and renders us numb to all the other blessings of God. So what do we do that? Can I give you five very quickly, five simple things. Maybe you leave here and think, busted. Maybe you're thinking right now, I am busted. I'm one of the nine. Boy, I could go through a laundry list right now of just things I'm blessed with, with daily bread kind of things, protection and food and housing, but looking at the spiritual blessings of God, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and we don't ever say thank you. It's just that we're thankless people. What do you do? Here's what I want to tell you. Steve Fuller, he's a pastor in Abu Dhabi. He says simple things. Let me tell you the first thing you can do. Seek the Holy Spirit's help. I mean, the goal of salvation is for seeing and feeling the glory of God's mercy. You can't do that on your own. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you see those things. Two, simple. Rem just remember God's gift. Um, and what do I mean by that? Sit down occasionally, once a week, and just list them out. It's kind of hard to be thankful for things that you don't remember. Just list God's gifts and how valuable they are to you. I made a list. I just focused on the spiritual things. I mean, I can make a long list of physical things. I, I just went to Romans 5 alone. Here's the ones that we get from Romans 5 alone. I'm justified by faith. I have peace with God, access to the Father, stand before God in grace, hope of the glory of God, protected from suffering in eternity. I have the love of God, the Holy Spirit. I'm saved from God's wrath. I'm reconciled to God. I'm adopted into God's family. I have redemption through His blood, forgiveness of sin, purpose for living. I went to other passages of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, I have the righteousness of Christ has been given to me. Ugh. Colossians 1, Galatians 2, Christ in me. I've been given mercy 
the peace of God, joy. Romans 6, victory over sin. I have the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. Spiritual gifts, future glory. I have two intercessors for me right now. Jesus is interceding for me right now and the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing gift. I have the power of God, prayer, wisdom, a home in heaven, freedom from fear, no condemnation, an advocate for me, future rewards, the presence of God, the word of God, provision, guidance, protection from the enemy, restores my soul. I'm kept by God. I've been given a call to ministry. I could go on and on and on. Maybe just list them. And then when you list them, do number three. Not only remember the value of what you've been given, remember the mercy of those gifts. How many of them on your list do you deserve? I mean, it's one thing. You may not be thankful if you just list all the gifts and think, well, I'm owed this. How many of those things do you deserve? None. I don't. Matter of fact, thank God mercy isn't just that I've been given things I don't deserve. Mercy reminds me my list of what I deserve is radically different than that one. If I'm making a list of what I have, it's that. If I'm making a list of what I deserve, it's death, separation, wrath punishment so number four what do you do I already gave you the answer to that one no blanks to fill in rinse lather repeat don't do that just once make it a habit of doing it because we're see we forget you might do that and be like God I give you glory next week we had already been infested with the disease of materialism again just do those first three things over and over and over and over again and you know what this last one on the list if you'll just rinse lather and repeat those first three steps guess what the last one will take care of itself what will it produce you will begin to do this you will begin to joyfully worship with thanksgiving How about you this morning? Which leper are you? What an odd question. (laughs) Ever been asked that? (laughs) Came out of my mouth right now. I'm thinking, nobody's ever asked me that before. Which leper are you? (laughs) I'm like, I'm not a leper. Wrong. Boy, before Jesus, yeah, I was decaying. Infested. He set me free. Fell off. How in the world do we wake up? People who were once lepers, been set free on the road to victory, and just never say thank you. That boggles my mind. Shame on us. Maybe you sit down here in the coming week, and you sit there in front of a table full of food, and you bow your head and I think the one time where maybe even thankless Christians do say thank you I'm not sure we really think about it and you're going to bless that food and give thanks for the food maybe this year think about it think about those words and maybe make your list a little further than thank you for the turkey and thank you for my family those are great things to be thankful for Maybe before Thanksgiving Day, you make a list. Go to God's Word. Let me tell you what will happen. You stand in front of that list and ask Him, what do I deserve? It will make your heart cry out with joy. It does. I think about it now. Why would he do this? I mean, why would he even care about a person like me or you? Because he's glorious. And because he's love. Why would he even touch a leper like us or care? Why would he even hear us? The rest of the crowd doesn't. Because he's wonderful. Because of who he is, not because of who we are. The least we can do, friends, I'm telling you, is is to say thank you, but we should megaphone. We should walk out of this building today along that dirt path like this man and pull out our bullhorns and shout it to the top of our lungs. I ask you to stand where you are. We're going to have an opportunity to respond to God's word this morning, this Thanksgiving. 
I'm going to pray for us. And however the Lord's moving you in this time, I pray that you come. We have plenty of space here. Maybe you just want to come down as a sacrifice of, for the Lord. Or just clear out distractions, whatever it is. Pray you come. Maybe you pray with someone. Maybe join me here at the altar. Pray that you would respond. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. I, I thank you for so many things. God, I thank you. So many, I'll, I'll never be able to have enough time to say thank you. Thank you for all of your good and perfect gifts to us. God, I ask your forgiveness. Here, you bought us. You paid for us on the cross. And there are lots of days where I wonder, did you get what you paid for? Forgive us. I pray in these moments we would respond to you in truth. And we would take action based on it. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. I pray this Jesus in your name. Amen.